In this video, we will uh, look at uh, some of the life-threatening electrolytes abnormalities. Uh, the objectives of this talk we will first to look at the hyperkalemia. We will first look at the basic signs of uh, potassium uh, uh, homeostasis. Then we will look at the problem of pseudo hyperkalemia. Uh, then we will look at the clinical features of uh, hyperkalemia, and then the management and the treatment in the emergency department. Then we will look at a quick do a quick look at hypokalemia. And before we look at hyponatremia um, and the need for uh, adjusting the serum sodium according to the glucose level, particularly if we, high, if we have a high glucose uh, uh, level. And then we will look at uh, some of the formulas for calculating so sodium deficits. Uh, we will just look at one of these uh, formulas. There are many formulas out there and the caveats when we are using the, these formulas. Uh, then we will look at the goal and the rate of correction of hyponatremia. First on hyperkalemia. Now, one of the recent updates uh, in the understanding of the physiology of potassium homeostasis is in the role of aldosterone itself. And although we know that aldosterone is a powerful stimulus for uh, renal potassium excretion, it only occurs at the supraphysiological level of the potassium, with very little effects uh, when the potassium is within physiological range. And so there is the catalytic uh, reflex that has been proposed, uh, that one that is arising from the receptors in the gut, in the portal veins, or the liver itself, and that is independent of the autostrone control. And the top figure here it represents the traditional understanding of the feedback mechanism or the feedback control, whereby we, we have a high intake of potassium from the diet. Uh, this a uh, high potassium uh, diet or the high potassium load will be absorbed uh, from the gut and there is a need for the serum potassium level to rise to a significant level before the aldosterone is uh, secreted that promotes uh, renal potassium excretion and this one will then reduce the potassium level back to the normal range and so this is the feedback loop or the feedback mechanism but now there is also the feed forward control the feed forward mechanism whereby when we have increased load of potassium in the gut itself, this will be sensed by the sensor or the receptors in the gut and this will then send a signal directly to promote the renal potassium excretion that is independent of the need for the serum sodium serum potassium level to rise to a significant level. And therefore it is a very rapid control mechanism. In other words, the gut feeling or the sensors in the gut is literally telling us that it is not easy to get hyperkalemia in a normal healthy individual because of the various mechanisms to regulate the potassium level. And this concept is also known as the potassium adaptation, uh, whereby we can have an enhanced efficiency of potassium excretion when the potassium intake is increased. And therefore, as mentioned, hyperkalemia is a rare occurrence in normal individuals because of this potassium adaptation. And so what we know so far is that increasing potassium intake alone from diet is not a common cause of hyperkalemia, especially in, in healthy individuals, unless it occurs rather acutely. And so if we have persistent hyperkalemia, it means that there must be some kind of impact uh, urinary potassium excretion. Uh, either because of the reduction in the aldosterone secretion itself or impaired body responsiveness towards the aldosterone or there may be some kind of acute or renal failure or chronic renal failure. But also there may be the problem of uh, large releases of potassium from the cells because of uh, increased tissue break breakdowns causing a transient elevation and therefore the problem of pseudo hyperkalemia. And this is common uh, because of the traumatic hemolysis from venous puncture and it can occur up to 20% of the samples. So the lab will usually report this as a slightly hemolyzed samples. Um, so it is due to the release of the potassium from the muscle cell distal to the tonicae with fist clenching. So it's common in leukocytosis where you get a total white cell count of more than 50,000 to 100,000. Um, millimeter cube or thrombocytosis of more than 500 to 1 million uh, millimeter cube. And way back in 1990, a study has been done on the effects of repeated fist clenching and isometric hand grip 
and this can increase the potassium level by as much as 1.6 from the contracting arm. Um, a common cause of uh, pseudohyperkalemia is thrombocytosis because of the potassium will move out of the plasma after clotting has occurred. And therefore, the serum potassium level is normally higher than the plasma potassium by about um, 0.1 or to about 0.5 millimoles per liter after the, uh, uh, the serum has clotted. But this is not a usual, usual, this is not usually a problem in healthy individuals. But Grebel et al. in 1988, 1988 in a sample of uh, 283 controls and 161 patients with reactive thrombocytosis uh, noted that hyperkalemia was found in 34% of the patients if the platelet counts of more than 500,000 mm per millimeter cube versus 9% of the patients if the platelet counts uh, was less than 250,000 per millimeter cube. And therefore, they found that there is an increase of the potassium level of uh, 0 0.15 millimoles. Uh, per liter for every increase of 100,000 per millimeter cube in the plus and uh, platelet counts. Now, leukocytosis is also a common problem because a high uh, white blood cell counts of more than 120,000, for example, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia can cause pseudohyperkalemia uh, because of the cell fragility and it's more common and uh, more prominent if we use the heparinized tubes. Uh, the centrifugation of this heparinized tube will cause the uh, cell destruction, therefore the release of the potassium. And therefore there is a need to exclude pseudohyperkalemia. And you should suspect if there is no apparent cause for hyperkalemia in an otherwise healthy individual, why, why should this, this healthy person get hyperkalemia? And one of the clues is to look for a wide variability in, in, in the repeated measurements of the potassium. So you may get a first sample, you get a sky-high potassium level, but as you repeat the second sample, you find that the potassium level drops drastically to, a, to within normal range. Uh, one of the things you can do is to attempt the venal puncture uh, without the use of the tonicate or repetitive uh, free scratching. And that was what I been one of the advice that was given to me when I was a house officer. And if you want to use a tourniquet, what you can do is to release the tourniquet after the needle insertion. And then you wait for a while, maybe a one minute or two, before you, you draw the sample. But it's not something that I commonly observe nowadays. Clinical features. Now, clinical features of hyperkalemia are rather weak, and sometimes it may be overshadowed by the primary illnesses that precipitate the hyperkalemia itself. And some of the more serious manifestations uh, is uh, um, muscle weaknesses or paralysis. Also, we can have some cardiac conduction abnormalities and cardiac arrhythmia. <coughs> and it usually occurs when the serum potassium level is more than 7 millimoles per liter. But the absence of the symptoms do not rule out hyperkalemia. The muscle weakness in hyperkalemia may mimic the guillain barre syndrome. Uh, where you get a where you get a symmetrical ascending muscle weakness that begins distally with the legs and it progresses progresses up uh, proximally to the trunks and the arms. But one of the caveat is that the finger tone and the cranial nerve functions are typically intact. So if you get a cranial nerve palsy, then you should look for any secondary cause uh, rather than due to the hyperkalemia itself. And the symptoms of uh, muscle weakness will resolve with the correction of hyperkalemia. Now, ECG manifestation. Now, the ECG manifestation do not do not just depend on the absolute level of the serum potassium itself, but they also in depends on the rate of increase of the potassium level. And therefore, we need to understand that the progression and the severity of the ECG do not col tolerate well with the serum potassium concentration. But um, for example, in a retrospective review of 90 uh, hyperkalemic, there's a uh, typing mistake here, you get a 90 hyperkalemic patients by Montec at all in 2008, and they found that the, although the probability of ECG abnormalities will increase uh, with increasing potassium level, but the ECG percent was insensitive, insensitive for the diagnosis of uh, hyperkalemia. This is because there have been anecdotal reports of severe hyperkalemia of even up to more than 9 millimoles per liter, but there was no expected ECG manifestation. But nonetheless, the ECG manifestation are common uh, when the serum potassium are more than 5.5 millimoles per liter. And the earliest ECG manifestations uh, is the T waves, the tall T waves. 
and how do we differentiate this tall T waves from those that are due to, for example, uh, the hyperacute T waves in myocardial infarction? The uh, tall T waves in hyperkalemia uh, is rather narrow base and peak rather than those due to myocardial infarction, hyperacute T waves, which uh, are broad base uh, in in this myocardial infarctions is. The, the tall T waves are best seen in leads 2, 3, V2 to V4, but it's only present in up to 22% of the patients only. But as we, the hyperkalemia gets more severe, there is the progressive lengthening of the PR interval and the QRS duration. And when the potassium level reaches uh, 8 to 9 millimoles, Liter, the SA node will continue to uh, be functioning uh, and it may stimulate the ventricles directly without any evidence of atrial activity. And this is because, as mentioned, the, the, the SA node is less susceptible to the effects of hyperkalemia. And therefore, you, you'll find there's an absence of P wave and there's a widening of the QRS comp uh, complex because the SA node now directly stimulates the uh, ventricles and this will mimic ventricular tachycardia. And as the serum potassium level reaches 10 millimole per liter, there is progressive widening of the QRS, and this will uh, merge together with the T waves producing the sine wave. Now, the management of uh, the uh, hyperkalemia in emergency department itself is basically the concept is to, to drive the potassium back into the cells. Uh, of course, the definitive management will be to remove the pot uh, potassium from the cells through some dialysis means. Now, the first treatment is uh, the use of calcium. Now, one of the things we need to understand about the effects of hyperkalemia on the action potential, cardiac action potential, is that uh, hyperkalemia will render the uh, resting membrane potential to be less negative. And as it uh, uh, renders the resting membrane potential to be less negative, um, the, uh, the, 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 the cardiac cells will then uh, be easier to reach the threshold potential, and therefore there is this initial stage of hyperexcitability. But as it goes along, the sodium channels will be exhausted and there will be the inactivation of the sodium channels uh, leading to decreased membrane excitability. And so what calcium does is that it actually restores the gap between the resting membrane potential and the threshold potential, and therefore it stabilizes the uh, membrane, the cardiac membrane. The effects of calcium is seen within one minute and it will last 30 to 60 minutes. And there's always a question of whether we shall we use calcium chloride or calcium, calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. Of course, uh, we know that calcium chloride contains three times elemental calcium as compared to calcium gluconate, uh, but it's more irritating upon injection. Now, insulin. Now, insulin works by stimulating the sodium potassium ATPase pump to drive the potassium back into the cells. And this effect is independent of its uh, effect on glucose. Uh, in fact, the glu glucose administration is uh, more to prevent hypoglycemia and therefore it's not uh, really necessary if the serum glucose is already more than 30 millimoles per liter. But the paradoxical effect is that if you use glucose without insulin, uh, this will increase the uh, plasma osmolarity and as it increases, the plasma osmolarity will draw the water out uh, from the cells and causing cell lysis and it draws the potassium, uh, potassium out from the cells as well. So there's a par paradoxical effect uh, of uh, increasing further the hyperkalemia, the potassium effects, the potassium level. And so do not use glucose without using the insulin. The effect of the insulin begins in 10 to 20 minutes after administration. It peaks at 30 to 60 minutes and it lasts for 4 to 6 hours. And it can reduce the potassium by 0 0.6 to 1 millimoles per liter. Uh, even in, high, in renal failure patients who may be resistant to the glucose lowering effect of insulin, uh, the hypokalemic effect of the insulin is still intact because the sodium potassium ATPS pump is still uh, active. Now, subutamol. Now, subutamol is a beta-2 agonist. It also works similar uh, to, uh, just like uh, insulin, it drives the potassium into the cells by increasing the activities of the sodium potassium ATPS pump. Uh, just like insulin, it can lower the serum potassium by about 0 0.6 to 1 uh, millimoles per liter. 
Um, but the thing is that if we use the uh, subutamol, the nebulized form of subutamol requires a much, uh, uh, for example, the nebulized form of subutamol requires a much higher dose uh, compared to the dose for nebulized subutamol in asthma patient. So you may need to use 10 to 20 milligrams of uh, nebulized subutamol versus 2.5 to 5 milligrams uh, of nebulized subutamol for asthma patients. And therefore, we need to watch out for the effects of um, tachycardia and sympathetic overactivity. Um, just like insulin, the effects will be seen in 10 to 20 minutes, it peaks to 30 to 60 minutes, and it can last up to 4 to 6 hours. But really the question is, is there any role of combining both the subutamol and the insulin? Uh, so Allen and Copney in 1990 has found that if we use insulin alone without the use of subutamol, uh, it can reduce the potassium level by about 0 0.6 millimoles per liter. And if you use subutamol alone without the use of insulin, it also similarly reduced the uh, potassium level by 0 0.6 millimoles per liter. But if you combine both the insulin and the subutamol, it can reduce the uh, potassium by about 1.2 millimoles per liter. And therefore, there is some synergistic effect if you combine both the insulin and um, the subutamol. Now, sodium so bicarbonate. Now, sodium so bicarbonate nowadays is more for uh, historical interest, and it's not really being used nowadays. Um, and it's mainly if, in the case of persistent metabolic acidosis, you may still um, consider using it. Um, but we do not expect the potassium level to change uh, drastically or acutely. For example, in a study by Bloomberg at all in 1992, it was very small samples uh, uh, of 12 dialysis patients. They find that there is um, no change in the potassium level uh, within the first four hours. It's only when uh, at four to six hours that they, they, uh, they did see a, a moderate decline in the potassium uh, level to about 5.44 to about 5.3 millimoles per liter. And even then, some of the patients have very minimal or, very, or no effect at all in the potassium level, even after six hours. So sodium bicarbonate is uh, an, um, a no-no unless you have some metabolic, uh, persistent metabolic acidosis. And if you use the serum bicarbonate, do not use it um, uh, together with the calcium uh, within the same syringe and the same uh, needles. And it can cause, it can precipitate calcium uh, uh, bicarbonate. Now let's take a quick look at hypokalemia. Um, generally, the serum potassium level will decrease um, by 0 0.3 uh, millimoles per liter for every 100 millimoles reduction in the total pot body potassium. And muscle weakness usually does not occur if the serum potassium level is still more than 2.5 millimoles per liter. Unless it, it, it develops rather acutely. And one other thing we need to understand is, uh, and to remember is that many of the hypokalemic patients will also have deficient Deficiency in magnesium, magnesium. so uh, hypomagnesemia is uh, may, may be another problem as well. So it may be worthwhile to uh, uh, remember to check for magnesium level if we get a case of hypokalemia. This is because the magnesium is important for the potassium uptake uh, uh, and also for the maintenance of the intracellular potassium level, especially in the myocardium. Uh, a quick note of hypomagnesemia is can be quite subtle, uh, but it's actually co much commoner than what is expected. It can be uh, present in up to 12% of the hospitalized patient, up to 65% of ICU patients in one study. Um, the neuromuscular manifestation include tremor, tetany, convulsions, weakness, uh, delirium, and coma. The ECG manifestation include like widened QRS, uh, big tall T-waves, widened PR, and uh, some ventricular arrhythmias as well. So it is very common if to, to, to uh, accompany uh, hyper, hypocalcemia, hypoparathyroidism, and hypokalemia. Now back to the uh, treatment of hypokalemia itself, uh, one of the things that we have been taught here is very easy to remember. It's 2 grams of KCR and 200 ml of over 2 hours, uh, 2 to two, 2, or 1 gram KCR over 100 ml over 1 hour, 1, 1, 1. And we remember, remember that the 1 gram of KCL is 30 millimoles of potassium. And the, the rate can go up to 40 millimoles per hour, which is equivalent to about 3 grams of KCL uh, for life-threatening conditions. Um, but one of the things about patients, if, uh, one of the interesting things about a patient with 
mild to moderate hypokalemia. And one of the things we, we, we like to do is to advise patients to, to just increase the intake of some kind of potassium-rich foods and fruits such as bananas. And, and this may not be a very effective strategy because the dietary potassium is predominantly, predominantly in the form of potassium phosphate or potassium citrate. Uh, which result in in retention of the potassium up to 40% only as compared to potassium in the KCL or potassium chloride. So it is bad news for the minions. Now, hyponatremia. Now, this is a common classification that we use. Um, we can classify them into hypertonic hyponatremia, isotonic hyponatremia, and hypotonic hyponatremia. And basically, it's to... Uh, rule out pseudo hyponatremia because of the hyperglycemia effect and the hyperlipidemia effects. Uh, the true hyponatremia can then be further divided into the hypervolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, for example, in the case of congestive cardiac failure. And then you have the euvolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, for example, in SIADH, or the syndrome of inappropriate uh, ADH secretion. And then you can have the effects of hypovolemic because of the f uh, body uh, fluid loss and the sodium loss. And because of the problem of pseudo-hyponatremia, especially in uh, a high glucose load in the body, there may be a need to readjust or do the uh, adjust the serum sodium level uh, because of the high glucose uh, level in the plasma. So high glucose load will cause osmotic shifts and this osmotic shift is then to pull the water from the cells and then it can cause a, the um, a cell lysine and so on and so forth as well. So the serum sodium uh, level uh, in, in, in an original study by Katz all back in 1973, and he said that the serum sodium level will fall by about 1.6 millimoles per liter for every 5.5 millimoles uh, per liter increase or 100 milligram per deciliter. Uh, increase in the serum glucose concentration above the normal uh, high normal range of 100 milligram deciliter or 5.5 millimoles per liter. Uh, in an, uh, um, an, uh, uh, a later study by Hillier et al. in 1999, if, if they, they found that the serum sodium will fall by about 2.4 millimoles for every 5.5 millimoles per liter increase in the serum sodium concentration. So there is a range of about 1.6 to 2.4 uh, millimoles per liter of the decrease in the serum sodium level if the, uh, for every 5.5 uh, millimoles per liter increase in the serum uh, glucose concentration. So let's say take uh, in between the 1.6 to 2.4, let's say we take about 2.0. Um, so the formula for the corrected serum sodium would be uh, measured serum sodium plus the serum glucose uh, minus the 5.5 uh, uh, above the, the high normal of 5.5, then times 2.0, as we, as we assume the 2.0 millimoles uh, per liter here, over 5.5. But this is usually not a problem if the... Um, the, the, the serum glucose level is within normal range or the uh, hyponatremia is not a severe case. Um, the other thing that we we, always, um, we often use uh, in the management of uh, hyponatremia is to use the formula to calculate or to predict the sodium deficit or the total sodium deficits. And there are many formulas out there, but one of the common ones is this formula where um, it states that the sodium deficit is equivalent to the desired serum sodium level minus the measured serum sodium times the total body water. And we, we know that the um, 50 to 60% of our body weight is uh, body water and therefore is the same as the desired serum sodium minus the measured serum sodium times 0 0.5 and some would take 0 0.6 because 60% of the um, the body weight is uh, body water, um, but for easy calculation, we take let's say we take zero point five here times the body weight, um, and, and the the reason is because I I would just want to show one pose here. Uh, if we use the three percent uh, sodium chloride, um, the this is sodium concentration is approximately about five hundred millimoles per liter, or one uh, one mil equals to zero point five millimoles per per liter. Let me just show this uh, little 
calculation here. Uh, this 3% here, 3% means that there is a 3 gram in 100 uh, mils, which means that you have the 30 grams for every 1 liter. So if it takes the 30 grams here and we times the 70, you get about 510 millimoles, uh, which is approximately about uh, 500 uh, millimoles per liter. And then we use the proportion of the, because of the uh, calculation here, they say if we use the uh, desired serum so, uh, desired serum sodium here minus the measured serum sodium times 0 0.5 here. And therefore, if you, if you do the uh, calculation, you, you will find that the, um, for every one mil uh, of increase, of, uh, for every one mil per kilo of body weight of serum uh, of uh, 3% uh, hypertonic cell line will increase the serum sodium by uh, 1 uh, millimoles uh, per liter. If you do the calculation, then you, you, you will get this proportion. And so it's just a, a, a little pulse here. Uh, let's say you have a patient with uh, 50 kilos uh, body weight. So uh, 50 mils of 3% um, 50 mils of, uh, 3 hypertonic cell line will increase the serum sodium by 1 millimoles per liter for this patient of 50 kilos. But some of the caveats in when, when we use the formulas, now formulas uh, may not accurately predict the magnitude of change in the serum sodium. Uh, for example, in a series of 62 patients with a baseline serum sodium of 112, page, uh, of 112 millimoles per liter and given hypertonic cell line, and they found that actually up to 74% of them has the increase of the serum uh, of the increase of the serum sodium uh, much higher as, com as what was expected. Now this is because that as we correct the, the sodium, uh, the correction of the, uh, of the hyponatremia uh, using especially this hypertonic cell line, it will remove the hypovolemic stimulus for the ADH release. So what we, it does is as we uh, replenish the sodium uh, in in the body, uh, we draw the water back into the body as well. And as it draws the water back into the body, it will remove this hypovolemic stimulus of ADH release. So there will be a higher uh, than expected diuresis, um, in which we will result in a higher change or higher increase of the serum sodium level. In fact, it can also be the the uh, the magnitude of the increase in the serum sodium can also uh, predict whether the the cause is due to uh, hypovolemia or due to SIDH. If it is due to hypovolemia, then the magnitude of the increase or the amount of increase of the serum sodium may be uh, what is expected or even higher than what is expected. But if the change or the increase in the serum sodium is not as, as expected or is lower than as, than what is expected, then probably you may think of it could be due to SIADH. So rather than just knowing the uh, formula and ra rather than just knowing the serum sodium uh, deficit, the total uh, sodium deficit itself, is to know the goal of the therapy, to know the, the rate and the amount, uh, the, the rate uh, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of increase that is needed. Um, so it has been suggested that a 4 to 6 millimole increase in the serum sodium is sufficient to reverse most of the serious manifestation due to hyponatremia. And in emergency cases, we, we can increase this 4 to 6 millimoles uh, over a period of uh, 6 hours. So what are the uh, indications for emergency therapy where we want to correct it rapidly, the 6 millimoles margin to uh, within the first 6 hours, is when we have patients with severe symptoms uh, of hyponatremia, for example, in patients with seizures and mental obtundations, or we have patients with uh, uh, symptomatic high, acute hyponatremia, even the symptoms are mild. Um, uh, maybe we have the patient with hyperacute hyponatremia, but uh, the patient may have some kind of psychiatric manifest, uh, illnesses because of some uh, self-induced water intoxication, for example, e even if the patient were asymptomatic during the initial evaluation. 
uh, we are not worrying so much about the serum sodium level uh, at that point or when we evaluate the patient, but we are more worrying about the risk of cerebral edema because of the osmotically driven water that can cross the blood brain barrier. And also in patients with symptomatic, uh, who, symptomatic patients uh, with some post-operative uh, hyponatremia due to some kind of uh, intracranial pathology. So in those kind of cases, we may need to correct the serum sodium uh, uh, faster and within the first six hours. Um, but uh, what is important to note, note is that we do not want to correct the hyponatremia too fast because of the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. And the, 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 the previous name uh, was CPM or central pontine uh, demyelination. But now it has been shown that the um, uh, the uh, demyelination does not just occur in the central nervous system but the whole nervous system as well. So the name now is osmotic demyelination syndrome. And so we do not want this to occur, uh, especially if you correct the serum uh, sodium concentration of more than 10 to 12 millimoles per liter within 24 hours or more than 18 millimoles uh, within 48 hours. So we keep it low, we keep the rate of increase uh, below 8. Um, but to be safe, we, we keep it about 6 millimoles uh, per liter over 24 hours. Uh, so there is a caveat here uh, that says that if 6 a day uh, makes sense for safety, so 6 in 6 hours for severe symptoms and stop. So what it means is that you increase 6 millimoles uh, of sodium deficit in, in a day, uh, it makes sense for the margin, the safety margin. Of course, you can go up to 8, but uh, the, the rate of increase may be much higher than what is expected. So we keep it a little bit lower to about 6 uh, millimoles uh, of, in of increase uh, per day. But in uh, severe symptoms, in severe hyponatremia, we may correct these 6 millimoles in the first 6 hours, and then we stop until the next day. So 6 millimoles a day makes sense for the safety margin, so 6 Minimals in six hours for those in severe uh, or emergency uh, cases of hyponatremia, and then we stop until the next day we can correct further. And so, in conclusion, um, in hyperkalemia, calcium is effective, uh, insulin is effective, subutamol is effective, and there is the synergistic effect if you combine both the insulin and subutamol together. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that if we use the nebulized subutamol, then it's, uh, can, we need to use about three to four times the, the usual dose that we use for asthma patients. So we need to watch out for symp sympathetic hyperactivity. Now, cranial nerve involvement in hyperkalemia is not common. So if we get a cranial nerve palsy, then probably we need to rule out another cause rather than just the hyperkalemia per se. Uh, in hyponatremia, remember that it, it can be... Um, uh, much higher than what is expected uh, in, in the presence of hyperkalemia. So therefore, there is a need to do some kind of uh, correction uh, of your serum sodium level uh, in the presence of hyperglycemia. Um, the formula used may be used just as a guide, uh, but be, beware that the, the rise in serum sodium can be much higher than expected uh, due to diuresis effects when we remove the hypovolemic uh, stimulus for the ADH release. And so more, than, more important than just knowing the formula and the uh, sodium deficit or the amount of sodium deficit is to know the goal of the, your management and the rate of your increase is uh, 6 millimoles a day. It makes sense for the safety. So 6 millimoles in 6 hours for severe symptoms and we stop. And this is, that's all for this uh, talk on 